The Range Brief with Blackwing. You're your hosts, Mark Gore and Jared Rainey. Mark, what are we talking about today? Yes, today we are going to talk about red dots on handguns. And we have a very special guest, Joseph King. Joe King. Joe, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, glad to be here, Mark and Jared. This should be pretty fun. You know, when it comes to the shooting sports, I've been enjoying them for 25, 28 years since I was a young person. Probably more important to this topic, you know, for the last several years, I've been running the training in the ranges department. So, you know, I have a pretty unique insight, uh, pros and cons with the uh, with the red dots. So I'm glad to chip in where needed, buddy. Absolutely. So getting into the topic here, talking about why you would want to put a red dot on your handgun, let's kick that over to Jared. Jared, what are your thoughts? Why do people want to do that? What's the benefit here? So the biggest thing that comes to mind, the biggest pro would be situational awareness. You're going from focusing on the front sight post and making that that focal shift from, okay, I see my target. Now I need to find my front sight post. I need to focus on that, get that crystal clear and, and match it up with my rear sight. We go from that to a hard target focus. Basically, you're seeing everything at that view, seeing everything through that perspective, staring at the target, and they're just putting the dot over top. So it really clears up your, I don't know, your uh, your mental engine, right? It gets yeah, you like, like going back and forth. Exactly. Your OODA loop's way smaller if you're yeah. looking through a red dot. And that's like, uh, it's because it's all in the same plane, that red dot is like essentially at the target. Exactly. Yep. Superimposed on the target that you're staring at. Exactly right. That situational awareness, that target focus. If I'm not staring at my front sight post, I can see if my target moves or if my target is seeking cover. Or if there's someone else behind your target. That's a great point. towards your target. Absolutely. And the next one would be accuracy. Uh, A red dot sight makes it so much easier to engage at distance. So I can shoot a six inch plate at 50 or 100 yards with a red dot with not that much difficulty. But if I try to do that with iron sights, it's far more tricky. Yeah, absolutely. And that accuracy, it's interesting you brought that up. I think a lot of people think about accuracy as at shorter distances, but that's really where you see the benefit is at the longer distances. Oh, 100%. Awesome, awesome. So we've been using optics on rifles for 20 years. I mean, you saw... First, the entire military went to it. And there were people skeptical, especially in the early 80s. People resisted going to optics. But now, every person has something on their red dot it's or something on their rifle or, or shotgun or everything. Everything's got an optic. Yeah. So why would we not put those on our handguns? Yeah, it is it is an interesting picture. I mean, like five years ago when very few people had red dots on their guns, on their handguns, you ask them if they had an AR and if they do, they probably have a red dot on it but they didn't have one on their handgun. Now it's getting more prominent, but definitely a a difference between the two. We're seeing a lot more people adopt it on the handguns. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, let's get a little bit into kind of what holds people back, why maybe you guys, our listeners, have thought about it but not made the move. And we'll go over to Joe on this one. Joe has not made the transition to Red Dots, and he's also, as he mentioned, on the range and training side. So he works with a lot of people, a lot of shooters, who may have not made that change. So Joe, what are you seeing? What holds people back? Yeah, that's that's a great question, really. And it's something we talk about in the shop quite often. Probably one of the first things that I end up hearing about is, you know, I'm, I'm worried about the durability of this said optic. You know, the slide reciprocating back and forth is a pretty violent action compared to what would be on a rifle and things. And so I do understand, you know, when people say that, I, you know, I, I, I can relate with them just because it is a very different motion. You know, I know we'll probably get into, you know, what you get for what price and things like that. So I'll kind of uh, just table that. But that's just one of the few things. Another thing that I hear quite often is... Well, before you go any further, let's dig into the durability here. And I guess there's kind of two types, right? So there's the durability of shooting the gun a lot. And then there's the durability of like carrying it, beating it up, banging it into things, you know, that side of thing. There's kind of the two there. So uh, you guys will go, Jared, what's your, what's your experience there? I know you're a red dot owner, red dot lover on handguns. What do you see on that side? Yeah, I was an early adopter. I got into the the red dot market is basically as soon as they were reliable enough to do so. And I would say breaking down those two types of durability and what we're talking about, a competition gun has to be tremendously reliable in a match, but not necessarily uh, very dependable if you 
drop it or mishandle it or expect it to do a long duty cycle. Whereas a law enforcement gun is not going to track as flat or shoot as quickly as a competition gun, but that gun is going to, it's going to live in a holster and it's going to work when you need it to. Yeah. So really breaking down those types of durability. And the simple answer is they can do it. On um, both sides, really, on right? On both sides, absolutely. You see guys running RMRs and all types of optics, Delta Point Pros in serious competition, shooting 10,000 rounds you know, every six months. And the optic is not the thing that's wearing out, right? Recoil yeah. springs are going before sights are. Uh, and then on the duty side, US military just adopted the M17 and the M18. That is an optics ready package. Yeah. They solicited that it has to have this capability. It can do it. And you're seeing police departments go to it, SWAT teams. And then, I mean, I've carried a Red Dot RDS on my concealed carry gun for seven years, and I've never had a problem yeah. with the durability. You know, pocket lint and all that stuff getting in there is not jamming up my stuff. Yeah. Well, and to break that down real quick, you saying RDS, just for those unfamiliar, that's not a brand. You're just shortening. Yeah. Slang. Red Dot site. Yep. Red Dot site. Okay. That's good. Good on this durability side, I guess, Joe, you would be a good person to talk about that too, because kind of the two types, two types of durability you see on the ranges, we've got red dots on our range guns, right? Correct. How are those tracking over there? Cause I mean, those are not babied by any means. No, they are not. They are torture tested and approved. We really have not had a whole lot of of uh, sights or optics or red dots really go bad. And I always, you know, kind of quote the uh, rental car effect, right? Drive it like you stole it type of thing. Yeah, and our, yeah. our rental guns are treated as such. You know, I'd say probably the only thing that we usually end up, you know, do messing with is the battery life. You know, yeah. again, neglect. We don't turn them off when we should uh, and things like that. But honestly, with the torture test of the range guns, I really haven't had any optics, including some less expensive models really sure. give me any trouble. So it's it's been pretty great, really. That's good to hear. Good to hear. And I guess before we get off this topic, too, we can talk a little bit about the types of red dot. Jared, do you want to touch on that? Uh, the emitter? Yeah. So you have open emitter and closed emitter. When you think open emitter, think one piece of glass with an LED basically shining its light on the lens and it's reflecting back to you. And that's where you're seeing the dot. A closed emitter is two pieces of glass and all of the working components are sealed in those, in those, you know, that glass sandwich. The glass sandwich, that closed emitter is always going to be more robust than an open emitter. One, because you can't get mud or dirt on the emitter to shut it off. Whereas with an open emitter, if you are shooting in heavy rain or you know, you've got a bunch of sand in your gun, it would plug up that hole and then you wouldn't see a dot. So if you're really looking for the ultimate in durability, there are options that are the closed emitter. Sure. The downside would be cost. Typically those are more expensive and they're bigger. They take up, they have a little bit more shroud yep. than your average, but still we're very robust. Aimpoint makes an option. SIG <clears throat> just came out with a, a new one. Lots yeah. of cool stuff. Absolutely. And for those uh, more along the education level of me, uh, emitter is just the laser shooty thing. It's the thing that shoots the laser out onto Dear the God. glass. Does. Yeah. So <laughs> that's what he's talking about there. Just in case you are curious, because I kind of am. Love the technical aspect for Mark. I really yeah, appreciate that. that. Room. This yeah. Is what happens. All right. Uh, moving on. Anything else, Joe, that, or what, I guess, what else are you hearing from people that that's holding them back. Yeah, yeah, I, I got a couple, a uh, couple of things I was thinking of as we were speaking there. Um, the battery life is one of my favorite things um, that you know I actually have customers come in like, oh sure. man, my, you know, my my optic, the battery's dead, the battery's dead, and, and it does happen. And my favorite thing when this does happen is like, oh man, you're right, I, I have a battery, we'll get you all taken care of. When's the last time you, uh, when's the last time you shot this gun? Well, you know, I put it on there a year and a half ago. I shot about a box and a half out of it, and I really haven't got it out since. Like, yeah. Okay, well, that's probably part of our problem. You know, so, you know, again, a good discussion about, you know, maintenance and taking care of your stuff and, and why. One of the other things very similar to that, um, that I have some people, you know, really drag their feet on it, and especially where they have made the jump, right? And then they say like, okay, I'm going to practice with this. And then they go home and they set their dot for a certain brightness in the dark, you know, cause this is going to be the one that protects their house and the bumps in the night. 
and then they come to the range where it's nice and bright and you know oh man the dot's too big or it's too yeah. small yep. and, and i hate this thing because i'm gonna have to constantly be pressing buttons instead of you know pressing triggers and again you know it kind of makes me chuckle you know it, it you can set a dot at a very fair level and it can work in 90% of the situations, right? It's that, excuse me, possibility, you know, versus probability. You know, the probability of you not seeing your dot because you're in, you know, there's two feet of snow on the ground and the sun shining is very low. You know, the yeah, probability yeah, of pulling your gun in a defensive situation is you will see your dot, you know? Yeah. So just, again, very easy conversations to have with, with some of our guests, if you will. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's one of those... Uh, things too that you always have the typically some kind of backup if if you don't have the dot there but before we get i guess talk about that jared do you want to touch a little bit on kind of some responses you would have to to those concerns so battery life is tough because absolutely and you're gonna you have this with rifle optics as well right unless you're running an aim point and it's got 10 years of battery life you can afford to leave it on right the battery will expire before it runs out of juice yeah you, you can do that with handgun optics, you can spend the money and get optics that are very efficient and have that extended battery life. But also there are some strategies of like, you know, some, some pre combat checks and like, know what your equipment is doing. What I do with all of my optics, I run either a Delta point pro or a Trigicon RMR on all of my stuff. And what I do is that thing has about a, you know, depending on what, what you set it at, uh, about two years of battery life is kind of what my game is. So every, Every year on my birthday month, I take the battery out and change it in all of them. And then I write the date that I changed them on the hood. And then I know a year from now, I need to change all these batteries. And I've sure, never had some one expire. wild birthday celebrations over here. Just oh, going around the house, changing all his batteries. Dude, my wife would agree. And yeah. I love this story. My civilian brain does not compute at all. It's so much fun. <laughs> Another strategy. It's actually more common or more often, I should say. But changing it when you change your smoke detector batteries, which you're supposed to do every two years, every twice a year, every wow. time the the time changes. But some people do it every two years. That's what I do. Need a firefighter in here. That's yeah. Sounds Jared, like we need to check Mark smoke Jared alarms. Is our, uh, Jared is our resident firefighter. I did find out that smoke alarms don't chirp when the battery dies. I thought that was a thing, but turns out most of mine were dead. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, on to the lighting changes. If you have batteries in your smoke detectors, you should change them every year. Just a heads up. And Twice a year, right? Say. Yeah. Yep. Jeez. Come okay. on, guys. Mark over here with these gems <laughs> of knowledge. I love it so much. Hey, we're just educating on all kinds of topics here. All right. So battery life. And there's also solar options. There's oh, yes. companies that make, I mean, you just take them outside and they'll charge themselves. Well, they'll they'll run off of the solar. They don't charge the battery, but they, they run off the solar. So it preserves your battery power. And then yes, that's true. Also, the um, motion activated. Yeah, so it'll actually shut off if you leave them, you know, still. Not great if you're carrying them around all day, but if you okay. like set it on your nightstand and it sits still for 45 minutes, it'll just shut off. And then as soon as you touch it, pick it back up, it turns right on. Turns right on to your yeah. last setting. That's a good point. Good point. So, so while we're talking about lighting settings, I'm gonna go into this next one, which would be you pick up the gun and either the lighting setting is too bright and you have a bloom or you don't see the dot at all. We'll talk about this a little bit when we get into like cost and things you can do to mitigate or solutions you find in, in actually when you're purchasing your setup. But realistically, if it's so bright that it blooms when you pick it up, I would say that is just as good as having an iron sight because it's gonna be just as thick, just as broad as, a, as your typical front sight post. So you're not gonna lose any accuracy. It might be distracting but I think if you're in the situation where you're like, man, my thought was really bright, that's probably the least of your worries. At least you have a sighting system, right? It's there for you when you need it. And if you pull up your gun and it's so bright outside that you can't see the dot, well, hopefully you have the time to turn up the brightness or you have your iron sights to fall back on on that system. Yeah, and Jared, you're exactly right. It's that whole probability versus possibility. Like if you're running a competition gun, you have time to set the dot where you want it. But the probability of you defending yourself with a firearm is at zero to 10 yards. So it can be the size of a school bus through the window and it's not yeah. going to matter. Yeah, man, I got some green, I got some red, I'm ready. Just <laughs> Yeah, and and I guess, Joe, if you want to talk a little bit about how that like co-witnessing works with the red dot, if it's not working, I know sometimes you have the raised sights, but 
you know, you've always got some kind of reference point that at 10 yards, right, that you can work off of? Yeah, that is such a fantastic question. So this kind of goes into the, <laughs> the good uh, you know, the psychology and in, in the physiology of your body, which I, I like to nerd out about. But let's say that you're one of those guys that puts a red dot on and you train, right? You decide like, I'm going to commit to this and I am, you know, really going to be a red dot guy and you're not just slapping it on and you shoot at the range once a year, right? So this is twofold. So one, if you present your firearm and you have no dot with the training that you've put yourself through, your brain subconsciously is still going to try to find a dot, right? So it's not going to say, oh, next step, look at my sights. Now to counteract that same point, with the right training and the right regiment, if you present your firearm to a threat and there's no dot, you know, especially if you train with reputable people, those sites are irrelevant anyway. Again, the probability of defending yourself is within zero to 10 yards. So again, looking through that window with no dot is just good enough. Yeah. So the, the, the proper way to set up a gun is to be able to co-witness, meaning the dot will sit um, on top of your front sight as you're looking through your rear sight, you know, just that added kind of secondary, you know, okay, everything's there. But just know for the people out there, you know, if you train the right way and you don't have a dot, your brain will still look for it, but it will be irrelevant when you go to press the trigger, you know, on a threat if you're training the right way. So it's yeah. kind of a twofold, like something that a lot of people don't really think about or realize, but there's studies out there that prove it. It's really interesting stuff. I'm a huge nerd. Sorry. Yeah. What's that? Like the natural. Yeah, the the repetition of doing it so many times you just you push it out into the right spot to that's to exactly with, right even without we, anything on there as we commonly say in in parallel you yeah. know it is a very common thing of what we train and, and discuss in our training programs i've seen people train with before red dots with no sights on their gun at all just a flat top just so they're they got that muscle memory that's what yeah, i was looking and, for and even more you know like they'll put a piece of tape over that red dot and still score hits yeah very good. Yeah, the included gun sight. Yeah, they used to like some two raids and stuff. They didn't have optics that you could see through. It was like an impo. Oh, getting, I'm nerding out here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm getting a little too deep that. over here. You can absolutely do that. <laughs> okay, moving on, Joe. What else are you hearing that is holding people back? You know, the one thing that, that I probably hear the most is, is just the cost. And we can talk about this significantly, but. I mean, you're putting an expensive piece of equipment on there, even on the lower end, some of that stuff, not to mention to attach it to your firearm properly. You know, you can get pretty expensive pretty quickly. Um, personally, one of the reasons that, you know, I haven't switched yet is none of my guns will really accept, you know, a, a red dot sight. So I'm either buying new slides, buying new guns, things like that. And, and just, I personally haven't made the transition because the training that I have with the front sights and, and and I just don't want to give up all my firearms to go buy new ones. That's probably the one that hits me the most. Sure. But before I go on, and, and I know we'll talk about costs quite a bit, quite a bit rather, my biggest concern and, and the, the thing I see on the range when it comes to disappointment the most is like somebody puts a red dot on their gun, goes in and shoots, and they shoot terribly. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, well, we can, you know, that's, that's easy fix. Like how much do you shoot? Well, you know, I shot four times this year. I've got 200 rounds in it. You know, it, it's going to take thousands of rounds to overcome, you know, a new habit and so on and sure. so forth. And again, it's, it's just another simple, you know, another simple point of like, Practice are you committing things. to this or yeah. not? You know, yeah. you, again, I, if you take anything away from what I say today is you can't just throw a red dot on your gun, stick it in a holster and expect to be awesome. It just does not work like that. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, we got, yeah, two to kind of hit there. Let's hit the cost one first. Jared, if you want to go over, I guess, just red dot, the, the, the different types of red dots, and then we can kind of hit the, the mounting and how to get it on your gun portion. Yeah. So the, the first thing you got to ask yourself is what are my priorities? If I'm, if I'm tipping my toe in this pond, I don't have to, I don't have to put it in a duty role. It's just purely a recreational thing. So I can see if I, if this is something for me, well, that puts your cost for the actual optic itself much lower. If you need it to stand up to a rigorous duty cycle, if you're going to carry it every day, if you're going to, you know, ensure your life with it, you need to step up and you're probably looking at anywhere, but I would say, you know, upper part of 500 to a thousand. And, you know, other than that, the recreational side, recreational sub 500 pretty easily for the red dot itself. And there's capabilities that are tied into that. So maybe a, I want it to be duty rated. Uh, maybe I want to have a closed emitter like we were talking about. 
Do I want it to have a night vision setting so I can, you know, see it with my nods on stuff like that. There's, there's like a whole bunch of extra features you can get into uh, and then holster compatibility, how are you going to carry it? There's a bunch that goes into that. And if you have questions about that, I recommend you go see a reputable dealer. Maybe, maybe come see us here at Black. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Scurry away. Uh, yeah. And you've got like solar motion activated, all those things add some cost to it. Closed emitter that adds cost to it. Yeah. There's a lot of variables in that. I would say if you can pick out the things that are most important to you, right? It, you can have everything you want, but what's it going to cost? You make your, make your wish list of things. What's critical and somebody can help you get, get there to the next step. Absolutely. Jared, real quick. I don't know what nods are, but you shouldn't be cursing on this show. Oh, come on. Yeah. Now. You know <clears throat> what that is. Jeez. We'll go kind of from the least invasive to the more invasive side. Dovetail mount is the easiest way to do it, to try it out. So that's going to be a device where you have a gun that's not cut for a red dot. It's just, you know, a normal gun. You're going to push out your rear sight and then you'll slide this plate that's going to sit on top of your slide and it's going to attach to your slide through the red dot uh, or through the rear sight dovetail. And that's going to run you maybe about a hundred bucks. And then it's going to give you the option to mount the red dot on, on the top of that plate. So you'll buy the plate that fits your gun and fits the red dot you want to put on it. That red dot, like a good mid range, like Jared was talking about before, uh, a mid range recreational one's going to be 250 to 350. Then you got another hundred bucks or so in the plate to get it on there. That's the quickest way to try it out if you want to. Downside is it's going to sit higher on the gun, which is not so great. That's not so great because it feels unnatural. Yeah, uh, We all have an expectation when you present a gun of how high the sights sit over the slide. And the that method of mounting usually sets the, the optic like a quarter inch higher than that, which that feels very unnatural. Huge. Yeah, it yeah. feels super, it feels weird. The other way you can get a red dot on your gun is to buy a new gun. So, hey, we're all on board with that. We sell guns. We would love to help you out with that. So that's that's going to be the route that a lot of people take. You just buy a gun that is already cut for red dot, which a lot of guns are these days. And what that's going to look like is you're going to see on top of the slide, there's going to be like a rectangular plate where you'll see like a seam. And uh, either depending on the, the size of the gun, you're either going to take that plate off and then put another plate on that's going to adapt it to fit a red dot on there, or you'll just take the plate off and you'll mount a red dot directly onto the gun. So the, the plates are adapters to let you put different types of red dots on there. Sometimes that's needed, sometimes it's not, but that's going to be the, the way most people go. A gun that's cut for a red dot is going to be a little bit more expensive, typically around $100 more expensive than the non-cut gun. So, you know, there's some costs associated with that as well as, you know, potentially trading in your gun, that kind of thing. But that's a, that's a route that a lot of people go. And then the third option is having your slide milled or cut for a red dot. So that's the kind of like the ideal way to do it, but it's probably also one of, uh, I don't know, it's middle of the road commonness, I guess. So that would be sending your gun that you have that's not cut for a red dot off to a gunsmith that can do this work and they will cut out that slide for a specific red dot. The benefit of that is you're going to get lower on the slide than you can with the other two methods typically. And it's going to get you kind of right in line with your tr traditional sights. So you're going to be as low to the barrel as you can be with the, the plate option, which is how that works for a lot of the new guns. You're going to be a little bit higher up. So if you wanted to co-witness with your sights and the red dot, you're going to have to get raised sights, suppressor sights, they call them. So uh, just being a little bit higher there. To get your slide milled to 300 bucks is something like what that's going to run. But you're going to be locked into the red dot type that you pick. There's different, all the different red dot companies, they have different patterns for where the holes are to attach to the gun. Of course, they want to make it complicated. So you have to be very specific. You have to know what you want ahead of time. You can't uh, just get a generic cut, if that makes sense. Yeah, there's no standard in the industry. Every manufacturer has their own proprietary hole pattern. And that's why you need the plates uh, for, for the new Adapters. manufactured guns. And for a lot of guns right now, especially if it's a, I would say a more common, if you got a Glock 17 or a Glock 19, you probably don't have to buy a, you don't have to send your slide off to get milled. You can just buy a slide. That's true. That's, that's already true. cut from a reputable manufacturer. Yeah. Lots of companies are doing it. And then if you wanted to switch back, the problem is those slides cost is 
half the value of yeah. the gun. A lot of people are like, oh, let's bucks. make the jump. Yeah, let's make the jump to a new gun. But that is a solution as well. Yeah, and I don't know that we talked about red dot sizes. So there's there's full size red dots, and then there's compact or concealed carry red dots. Um, I don't think there's technically categories for them, but that's what we call them. So the full size red dots, those were the first ones around. Typically, therefore, the the full size quote unquote guns, the bigger guns, and then the compact or concealed carry red dots. Those are for smaller carry guns like Sig 365s, Glock 43Xs, Springfield Hellcats. What's kind of nice is the full size red dots. That's where there's like five different patterns for where the holes will be. And you have to have the adapter plates a lot of times, all kinds of things with the concealed carry red dots. By the time they got around to, to putting those on guns, which is maybe just two or three years ago. By two years ago is when you really started seeing it. They, that one actually kind of is standardized. Everyone does the same hole pattern. So that makes it easy. Um, there, I guess that make it sound easier than it is. Yeah, that's, It is the same hole pattern, but sometimes you have to modify stuff or put adapter plates still. It gets really weird, to be honest. Old school phone chargers. Yeah, it might like look like it's going to work, but it's you have to do some gunsmithing to make it work properly. And yeah, it gets weird. This is where we could probably spend an entire episode talking about what fits what, but you're really best off just finding someone, you know, a local gun store that knows what they're doing and then bringing them in what you're wanting to do, telling them what your, what your requirements are, what you're looking for, and then having them help pick out what'll work and hopefully have a, a gunsmith mount it just to make sure everything works right. You've got the screws locked tight and torqued to the right level. That's super important to make sure your zero sticks, your flight site doesn't fly off the gun. Um, everything works like it should. Yeah, while it might be distracting to pull up your gun and have an overly bright dot, it's really distracting when you shoot the first round and the red dot gets you in the face. <laughs> and we seen have it. seen, seen that happen, yeah. Seen it. So always a, yeah, always a good idea. And then we can hit, Joe, your your last hesitation that you've seen, which is seems like maybe just like a you know an experience, a time with a red dot, you know, training potentially. I guess, you know, you guys can both talk a little bit about what's the, what's the round count needed to get comfortable with a gun with a red dot, you know, just getting started, not having shot a gun with a red or a handgun with a red dot. And what kind of expectation should you have going into this? What do you, what do you think? What do you see here? I have a little story I like to start with. I love okay. That. So private Ramey, private Ramey's pulling down $700 a month. And that's you, Jared. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm making no cash and I decide as this young soldier, like I'm going to, I'm going to invest in this new technology. I want to be ahead of the game. So I drop $700 on the optic. I drop another $300 on a, on a Glock 17 slide and I'm stoked, right? Got a month of pay invested in this thing. Like I'm, I am so excited to go to this, to the range and dominate. I go and I underperform. I suck, right? This thing is hard to find the dot on. Uh, I'm inconsistent. My draw is slower. Is this different from usual for you or? Oh, how dare you? Easy. <laughs> Hatred. Um, seething anger. But no, it was, it, it, I was like, man, I made a huge mistake and I'll never be able to unlo unload this thing because it was, you know, it was early on. But then once you put some time, once you put in some effort into it, man, it's a game changer. It, it's like having a suppressor. It's once you do it, you don't want to go back. Tell us about uh, tell us about your experience there, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I'll kind of come from it from like a training aspect. You know, first thing you got to do is figure out what your goal is. You know, if your goal is to become proficient in self defense, you know, you got to do the reps, you got to draw the holster, you got to present the firearm, and you can do that with some dry drills, if you will. Right? You find the red dot in the window as you present to the target, and it does take reps. Everybody's a little different, but my old favorite thing is. 30 times for 30 days and you're going to get there, right? That's a great, that's, that's the hardest part. Is it, it, picking it, the gun up and seeing the dot. It is. It really is. I mean, I'm still the guy that's wiggling my hand around trying to find the dot because I haven't committed to the training. Now, with that being said, you know, dry fire cannot solve all your problems. Okay. So I, I did overcome finding the dot when I present my firearm, right? Well, the other part that people forget is when they press that trigger and the gun goes off the first time and they're mitigating the recoil and the gun comes back down. And then they're like, oh man, where's the dot? The so, so it does take, you know, thousands of rounds. Um, it does take commitment to really make sure that, you know, you can put 
target or rounds on targets quickly. And it does take rounds down lane or down range, obviously. Um, but once you do figure out that recoil management, I would argue slightly, especially at distance, you will get faster and you will get more accurate. That's that's one little tidbit I have, if, if you wouldn't. Sure. So what, I mean, what are we talking round count wise? Is it, you know, is it a couple of visits to the range? Is it a thousand rounds of case ammo? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I mean, to me, the best way I can put it is one, everybody's different, but to put it in perspective, a guy that I admire and has tons of followers and is world renowned. Is that me? He <laughs> took, he said it took him a thousand rounds to find the dot between recoil and it took him another 5,000 rounds to get as proficient with it as he was with iron sights. So if that gives you any perspective coming from a guy who shot millions upon millions of rounds, I can tell you it's going to take me a few more than a couple thousand to figure it out. And again, one of the reasons I haven't quite committed to it yet. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Anything else you have to add there, Jared, as far as expectations going into it or round count or anything like that? I think that's the critical the critical word is expectation. Um, if you think you're going to buy a red dot and it's going to change your shooting your shooting proficiency, you're you're going to be disappointed. If you have, <clears throat> I know you want to get into it, and you have some discretionary funds and maybe another gun for concealed carry it will make you better. You will be a more effective shooter when you are proficient with a red dot, but you need to know going into it that you're going to have to invest some time, some cash, and and just like, like Joe was saying, you got to do the reps, man. You got to figure it out. Yeah. So it sounds like a good place to start would be go to the range once a week, shoot two boxes of ammo, 100 rounds, and try that for two, three months, and then kind of see where you stand before you give up on it and say, Hey, you know, all is lost. This is terrible. Yeah. I don't disagree with that at all. I mean, as I said earlier, you know, never expect to slap a red dot on your gun, put it in your holster and you be proficient with it. Or same as I haven't got this out of the box in a year and a half. Like it's, it does not work like that. It just does not. Absolutely. Okay. Very good. Looking at putting a red dot on your gun, you know, we've kind of talked about the benefits. We've talked about some things that might hold you back and we talked about how you can do it. What are your options to get it on there and then how to get confident with it, how to get proficient with the red dot. Any other insights you guys have on someone looking to do this? Any tips or tricks or anything else that we haven't touched on? Target focus. I cannot, I cannot say this enough times. Target focus. You don't focus on the dot, you focus on the target and you're putting the dot over top of it and squeezing the trigger like you normally would. If you do that, you will be successful. Awesome. Good Absolutely. Advice. And and the one thing that I, I've been, I've had in my mind that I would do want to tell, and, and this came from uh, one of my peers at the shop who works with a lot of uh, students one-on-one. -on -one. If you, you know, I have pretty good eyesight, so this is not for me, but if you wear progressive lenses for daily, daily, just navigating life, you need to switch to a red dot immediately. Because what, what we see is when you present a firearm in front of you, if you have a front sight, a rear sight, and a target, and you're bobbing your head up and down because you're checking the target, you're checking your front sight, making sure you're looking through the rear sight. I didn't realize it, but you know, somebody with progressive lenses that puts a dot on their gun, they stare at a dot, or excuse me, they stare at a target, the dot's superimposed on the target, and they become so much faster, so much more accurate, so much more proficient. So again, if you wear progressive lenses, you cannot buy a red dot fast enough. And this is coming from a guy who does not rock red <laughs> dots. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point too, thinking about getting co competent with a red dot as a beginner versus as someone who is a, a recreational shooter who shoots a good amount. You know, if you're already good with a handgun and then you put a red dot on, it's going to take you a while to get back up there. But if you are a new shooter, you know, that might lower that amount of rounds. It might be, I, I would have to imagine it's easier to get going shooting a gun with a red dot than learning how sights work and how they have to be, you know, even up and how to line them up, that kind of thing. Yeah. Get started with a reputable training company, you know, or, or a business. I mean, if it's not us, just do your homework, make sure they're not just teaching, make sure they're instructing. They know and, and understand what they're telling you and why I, I, I mean, 
call me biased. You guys want to sell guns. I want to see people training, but yeah. man, you know, training can overcome so much. And especially for a new shooter, if you just spend an hour or two one-on-one -on -one with an instructor with your equipment, you will save yourself so much money and ammunition in the long run. You really will. Yeah. Yeah. Like one or two, whatever they run $7,500 an hour sessions. If you're, you know, even a, a competent shooter can help you worlds. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And in that instruction. Great. Well, I think that wraps up our episode on why to, to get a red dot. If you have questions like we mentioned, we're always happy to help. Uh, or if you're not nearby, feel free to find your local shop, someone that knows what they're talking about. Want to pass it back over to Joe or Jared for something? Maybe? I really just had to say one thing. Okay. In your last episode, you quoted me as the hearing protection guy. Yes. And I... <laughs> I have had conversations about hearing protection with people. They were kidding, folks. It's not fun for me. No, just kidding. <laughs> but when it comes to red dots and shooting and training, I am happy to talk to you. So come on in. I just wanted to, you know, throw that back at you guys real oh, quick because it was appreciated. You will forever be the hearing protection man. <laughs> yes, that, I just I couldn't let it go. I had to mention it. Yeah, that was. Um, yeah, didn't think that people were actually going to take you up on that, but Joe, yeah, absolutely. He's laughing so hard right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. You he guys are awesome. Like that you did so out. great. Well, appreciate you guys all for listening in to the episode today. If you know someone else that you think might be interested in this topic, feel free to send them over this episode. Hopefully it can help introduce some more people to Red Dots or encourage them to get started with a Red Dot or transferred over to it. Also, don't forget to do the usual uh, podcast ask to subscribe to us, and rate us, write a review, whatever else you can do to help us out. That would be great. If you Even have if ideas. you have to make something up. Yeah. If you have ideas, if you want to hear about something in the industry, uh, please send us an email at, what is it? Wherever you want to send it. It's uh, not, not Jared at. That's oh, for that's sure. right. All right, yeah, Jared. Yeah, Jared at blackwingsc.com. You already said it. So yeah, it's cutting in all this out. You guys yeah. gave the power to the wrong man. Absolutely. Thank you for listening again, and we will hopefully see you next episode.